there is still a remnant. And there is still a plan. Romans 11. All right, this is where we're at. We're, our, we're going through the book of Romans verse by verse all the way through. And we're at the end sort of of Paul's discussion really on salvation. The first 11 chapters are really Paul discussing and understanding and giving us a full grasp as much as humanly possible what salvation is, who it's for, and how God does it. The last three chapters of Romans 9 through 11 are really discussing particularly to the Jewish people, to the Israelites, and discussing the attitude that they have in the first century after the resurrection. Because there's this idea that because the Israelite people were chosen by God and preserved his word all throughout history and were God's chosen nation and he had been there protecting them, that they were special, they were unique, they were saved solely through being a descendant of Abraham and Jacob. And Paul is really helping you understand that, no, salvation does not come through who you are in terms of who you're a descendant of, what family you came from, which tribe of Israel you came from. Salvation does not come by works. Salvation comes by grace through faith in Christ alone. And part of what he was trying to get the people to grab, grapple with and, and wrap their heads around was that, no, there is no difference between Jew or Greek or Jew and Gentile when it comes to salvation, because salvation comes by faith alone through Christ. Well, in chapter 11, he really gets to the culmination of this idea where now the pushback is, well, if there's no difference between a Jew or Greek or Jew and Gentile, does that mean that Israel itself as a category is no longer exists as separate from the church? Has the church replaced Israel with the promises of God? Or are, is there some sort of mystery about the church? Does Israel still hold on to its promises from being descendants of Abraham and David? What's going on? Now, there's actually a, a theology called replacement theology or fulfillment theology, which tries to understand some things and by doing so has replaced the church or has replaced Israel with the church as though church, it, the church, the bride of Christ is now the spiritual uh, receiver of all the promises to Israel. And it's no longer a physical category, but a spiritual category. And the church has replaced Israel. I'm going to push back against that tonight with Romans 11, because I think that that does not hold up to biblical scrutiny. Though I don't hate scholars for thinking that in a time when they created this idea. Imagine with me Israel's history. Israel itself is started by God calling Abraham out of this secular world and saying, you, I choose you. Leave your family, leave your homeland, and go to a land I'm going to promise you and your descendants. And Abraham, by faith, follows God and goes to the eventual land of Israel. And he's promised that his descendants, Isaac, and then Jacob, and all of Jacob's descendants become the people of Israel as Jacob's name is changed to Israel. And there are promises specific to them. But these people were also enslaved for 400 years by the Egyptians, only to be let go to take over the land that they were promised. But even after that, they continued to have civil war and persecution. And then they get kicked out of the land in 605 to 586 BC, when the Babylonians come in and siege the land and kick them out. But then they come back after the Persians take over. But then when the Greeks take over the Persians, they get persecuted again, and another genocide of the Jews happens. Meanwhile, in their history, they were enslaved for 400 years while, while the Pharaoh tried to genocide all the babies of the Jews. Now Antiochus Epiphanes in Greek history is trying to 
put a genocide out on the Jews and kill as many as he can and enslave them as much as he can. And then they're under serious persecution with the Romans. And we even know in Israelite history, up in modern times, we have the genocide of the Holocaust. They are the most persecuted people in history. There's actually a story about Queen Victoria and her prime minister where she said, give me one example to show me that the Bible is true. And her prime minister's response was the Jew. Because if you look at Israel's history and what the Bible says about them, then you look at a people who have been persecuted beyond belief throughout history, yet somehow every time they come together, they have experienced success and blessing. Israel recently posted a budget surplus in the midst of an era where they're at war with Hamas. They are the third or fourth largest exporter of produce in the world in a country that's the size of New Jersey. They're just experienced recently the worst attempt at genocide since the Holocaust while at war. But does God have a plan for these people? How do they still exist? In 1911, Encyclopedia Britannica said that there would not likely ever be a complete understanding of the Hebrew language again because of the persecution of the Jews and how there was no longer a homeland. This is what I'm trying to get at. At 70 AD, just a handful of decades after Christ's resurrection, the Roman Empire kicked the Jewish people out of Israel. They destroyed the temple and kicked them out of Israel, and they were dispersed through Europe and Asia and the world eventually. They got integrated into other cultures around the world, but yet they still managed to maintain and keep a hold of the scriptures and their culture through synagogues. But even all the way up through 1911, there was this idea that almost 2,000 years had gone by without Israel existing on a map. Now imagine the Bible scholars in this time frame, within those nearly 2,000 years, trying to make sense of a Bible that has specific promises for this nation without that nation existing. You try to come up with an explanation, and then that explanation becomes deep tradition in the theology of denominations. But then everything gets blown up in 1948, because at the end of World War II and the tragedy of the Holocaust, the UN and President Harry Truman sign into existence Israel, just as predicted in the scriptures, in Isaiah 66, verse 8, where God says, that the nation would be reborn in a day, speaking specifically of Zion. And in one single day, the nation of Israel was reborn. And so it's very clear that we're witnessing prophecy fulfilled right before our eyes in modern times relating to the, the people of Israel, yet tradition in many denominations says that the church has replaced them. I say it's refuted right here. So let's take a look. Romans 11, verse 1. I say then, this is Paul, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, right away, this question of, is God still on, still have plans? Is he still on the side of the people of Israel? Right away, Paul says, has God cast them away? No. The question's already answered. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars and I alone am left and they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And Paul is referencing a story in 1 Kings 18 and 19, where Elijah the prophet thinks, really, he's the only one left who worships God. And even being the only one left, he thinks, who still worships God and holds true to the scriptures, picks a fight 
with the prophets of a false god in Israel. And he takes on 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah and says, let's meet at Mount Carmel. We'll both build altars and whoever's God shows up and lights the altar on fire will know is the real God. And only Yahweh, Jehovah, the true God, lights Elijah's altar on fire while the other 850 prophets look like fools. And after that moment, the king and his wife Jezebel hear about Elijah's display. And now they're going after him to kill him. And Elijah thinks he's the only one left, and now the king and the queen want to kill me. And he runs away and he hides in a cave. Isn't it amazing a guy was willing to stand up to 850 guys, but then Jezebel wants to kill him and he runs away to a cave? But he does, and he thinks, God, I'm the only one left. And God reminds him that he has a remnant in Israel, those who still believe and hold true. And what Paul is pointing out is, yes, Christ is resurrected. And even though Paul, when he goes to everywhere to evangelize, he goes to the Jew first into the synagogues and then to the Gentiles when they reject him, even though there's this constant rejection by the people, it was prophesied that they would, but God would hold a remnant because he still has plans for Israel. Just like Elijah. Elijah planned or thought he was the only one left, but God told Elijah, no, there's a remnant. They are still my people, and I'm still going to take care of them, even though things look bleak right now. Interesting that Paul uses Elijah as the example. Because Elijah prophesied to the people when it seemed like everyone was against God and would not turn back to him. But... God promised and told Elijah that there would be a remnant. Interestingly, in the book of Revelation, during the last seven-year period of human history of God's judgment, when God says he's going to judge the world during the Great Tribulation, he provides two witnesses, and one of them looks an awful lot like Elijah. Elijah who never died, who was just picked up and cast into heaven. Interesting that Elijah might be one of those two guys who comes back to preach the gospel for three and a half years to prepare people for the return of Christ. While there's what? A remnant of believers in Israel. Because Revelation also tells us there would be 144,000 people ministering the gospel from each tribe of Israel because God will have a remnant even in the end. And that remnant will come from Israel. So that's a word we need to understand, remnant. And understanding this, when you get chapter 11, everything else in Scripture will start to come into focus because you will understand the end game, the story that's being, point, that's being pointed to. And Elijah being used is an interesting reference. Now it says, And if by grace, or I'm sorry, I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal, even so, then at this present time there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. So what is he saying? You only get saved by grace, not by works. You cannot save yourself. You only, have, you only get saved by putting your faith in Christ Jesus, who saves you by grace. His grace. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded, just as, as it is written. God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that should not see it, and ears that should not hear, to this very day. So Paul is quoting the Old Testament here, and he's, he's quoting Isaiah 29 and uh, parts of Deuteronomy, pointing out that God knew that this was going to happen, that when the Messiah came, there would be those who would be spiritually blinded, to his truth, yet God would still set aside a remnant because he still has a plan for Israel. And David says, this is Psalm 69, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their back anyways. So God knows, he foreknew. Now, earlier on in chapter 11, he said God foreknew. It doesn't mean that he's forcing the people to not believe in him, but God knew beforehand 
that this would be the result, but these people would freely turn their back on him, yet God still sets aside a remnant because he has a plan for Israel. I say then they have stumbled that they should not fall. Certainly not. So the question here is, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Now the the word fall there is really, have they fallen to a point of no return? Has Israel's rejection of Jesus right after the resurrection in the first century, have they gotten to a point where they cannot come back, where God would turn his back completely on them? That's what verse 11 is saying, and Paul's response is, certainly not. But through their fall, through their failure to recognize the Messiah, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, If their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? What is Paul saying? That through the the Jews' rejection of Jesus, through the Israelites' rejection of the Messiah, the Gentiles have been blessed. If you and I have been blessed through the rejection of the Messiah, imagine how much more the world will be blessed when Israel accepts their Messiah because God still has a plan for them. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. Now Paul here recognizes Paul's entire missionary journey in life is going to evangelize and to preach to the cities and start churches. And everywhere he goes, he preaches in the synagogues first, to the Jew first, But the only response he's getting is from the Gentiles. And even though that bothers him and it hurts his heart, he still says, I magnify my ministry. What he's saying is, I love what I do because what I'm doing is what I'm called to do by God. What is God calling you to do? What has God put in your heart for the gospel to expand? When you find that, you will love it. Even if it doesn't make sense. And that's what Paul is saying here. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them, for if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, will their acceptance be but life from the dead? And what he's saying is, if in this my ministry to the Gentiles causes some Israelites to question and even come to saving faith in Jesus, it's totally worth it because God loves the Israelite too. For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do you not boast against the branches? But if you do not boast, remember that you do not support the root. The root supports you. What is he talking about? Well, the olive tree can often be hollow. And so what he's saying is, as you prune an olive tree, you might find actual wild olive branches that grow olives off in the wild. But if you want to control that, you can graft a wild olive branch into an olive tree so that it will grow from the root and not die. Why does that matter? What is the parallel that he's painting? What he's saying is, God chose Israel to be his chosen nation, his chosen people. They preserved the word of God, copied it, and gave it to the world. They were, supposed, they were the ones who gave us this light. The root is Israel. And they support us. We wouldn't have the scriptures and the understanding of who the Messiah is if it wasn't for Israel. These people were chosen. We did not overtake them. We were grafted into the promises but they still have the promises. They support us. We don't support them. That's what he's saying. So the wild branches, the Gentiles, those who were outside of the original olive tree that have come to saving faith in Christ are grafted into the root. But Israel is still the root. Even though some of Israel's branches have been cut off by rejecting Christ, Israel is still the root. and God still has a plan for them. I hope that makes sense. So you will say then, branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off, and you, stand by faith, do not be haughty, but fear God. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. 
Therefore, consider the goodness and the severity of God, of those who fell, severity, but towards you, goodness. And so God's point is, yes, the word of God came through Israel. Israel is still the chosen nation. God still has a plan for them. But some of them were cut off because of their unbelief. And that gave space for the Gentiles to believe in God. And you got grafted in. That's good news for you. But it's also bad news in that God judges. And if you don't come to saving faith in Christ, you are cut off because you bear no fruit. God's only going to graft in those that bear fruit. So fear God because God is the judge. He makes the judgment. So come to saving faith in him. Now he says, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you will also be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. And just because some of Israel has been cut off for unbelief doesn't mean that God can't bring them back in because God still has a plan for Israel. In fact, this is really painted in Zechariah. We'll get to that in a little bit, but just remember that Zechariah points us to an eventual point, eventual point where the people of Israel will come to saving faith in their Messiah. It says, For if you were cut off by the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, who are natural branches, be grafted into their own tree? And so the point Paul is making is, you, a Gentile, who were not of the original chosen people, were able to be grafted into the tree. You were able to be saved by faith. How much easier should it be when the natural branch, the Israelite, turns to faith in Christ for them to be grafted back in and for God to give salvation to the Jew because God still has a plan for Israel. I don't know if you caught that. There's a theme, but the theme is God still has a plan for Israel. <laughs> Now, verse 25, for I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And now we have a real answer to this question. What is God's plan with Israel? Has the church replaced Israel? Clearly not. Just look at what this verse says. Paul is speaking to his Israelite brothers and sisters, people he wants to see come to faith, saving faith, or Jews that have come to saving faith, but recognize how many people have rejected the Messiah while the Gentiles have accepted him. And he says to them, don't be ignorant of this mystery of the church, of this thing that we're seeing grow right before our eyes, even outside of God's chosen nation. He says, don't be wise in your own opinion, Remember that this blindness has happened to Israel. This rejection of the Messiah has happened to Israel until when? Until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. So when God sees that number, whatever number he's got in his head or in his plan of Gentiles being saved, when that number is reached, God will turn back to Israel and what that looks like is mapped out be between Revelation 6 through 18. That's what it's all about. God still has a plan for Israel. And that plan will come to fruition when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. So if you would love to see Jesus return and to experience the pleasures and the wonder of the millennial kingdom that is spoken about in Revelation 19 through 22, then get to work. Because <laughs> I want to see that fullness, that number come in. I want to see God recognize that his plan has been fulfilled. The fullness of the Gentiles come, comes in, and he turns his heart back to Israel. And then it says in verse 26, and so when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, right? Verse 26, and so it, all Israel will be saved as it is written. When the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, heart of God goes back to Israel. Israel will be saved. And it says, the deliverer, this is quotes from Isaiah, the deliverer, 20, Isaiah 27, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. 
for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Ungodliness from whom? From Jacob, from Israel. This is God's covenant with his people Israel that he will take away their sins. Now, in Zechariah chapter 12, it also points this moment out when God takes away the sins of the remnant of Israel who believe. So all that are left, all of the remnant that survive this final judgment, the day of the Lord, Revelation 6 through 18, what you can find in Zechariah, Daniel, Ezekiel, when book of Joel, the day of the Lord, when, is, when that is completed and Jesus returns and the Messiah comes back, this is the moment that Zechariah chapter 12 points out in verse 10, where it says that they will look upon him whom they have pierced and they will grieve for him and they will recognize that he's the Messiah and they will be saved and God will set up his kingdom in Jerusalem from that point forward. That's pointed out to us that there will be a moment when they look upon him when he's returning and they'll recognize that's the one we pierced. That's the Messiah who we pierced on the cross. That's the one. He's our king. He's the rightful son of David who's now going to sit on the throne and set up his kingdom. That's the plan. Now, this reminds me of the book of Ruth. Now, remember, I'm speaking tomorrow on the book of Ruth at Cornerstone if you want to hear more. But here's a general outline. In the book of Ruth, you have a mother-in-law named Naomi, who is an Israelite. You have her daughter-in-law named Ruth, who is a Gentile. Her son married Ruth in Moab. So she's a Moabite. She's a foreigner. She's a Gentile. Well, all of the husbands die, and Naomi returns to Israel, and Ruth goes with her. And ultimately, Ruth marries a close family member named Boaz, who is the kinsman redeemer in the book of Ruth. And through that, Boaz marries Ruth, the Gentile woman, and through doing that, redeems all of the property and land that belonged to Naomi's family, which means that Naomi is also redeemed through the marriage of Ruth. There's a whole lot more that we're going to get into tomorrow, but here's the point. Naomi represents Israel. She's an Israelite. Ruth is a Gentile. Ruth comes to saving faith and belief in God through Israel, through Naomi, through her relationship with Naomi. So because of Naomi's tradition and what she had kept in her family, Ruth comes to saving faith in God and belief in God. But Naomi is not fully redeemed until Boaz marries Ruth, until Boaz, the one who represents Jesus, marries his Gentile bride. Then Israel is redeemed after the wedding. That's an entire look at the scope of Scripture in that little story. The fall of man, the exile of Israel, the return of Israel in unbelief, the saving of the Gentiles, the wedding supper of the Lamb, and which is in Revelation 20, and then the saving faith of Israel upon seeing the one whom they've pierced. They get saved because of the, the Redeemer marrying the Gentile bride. Israel is saved. So yes, God still has a plan for Israel, and it's been playing out through all of Scripture. And they will be saved. So no, the church did not replace Israel. There is a whole lot more to it. And it will help us understand the rest of Scripture by getting that correct. Verse 28, concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. Interesting. They're still elect. So they're still chosen people, even though they haven't come to saving faith. So election is not the same as salvation but they're still chosen by God, but they are enemies of the gospel. Interestingly, that's still kind of the case. Like It's difficult to talk about the gospel in public in Israel. There's even some laws on the books that they were trying to put on this year to keep people from preaching the gospel in public in Israel that were struck down in the Knesset. But enemies of the gospel, yet still the elect, still the chosen people of God. Beloved, for the sake of their fathers, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
For the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. For as you were once disobedient to God, you have now obtained mercy through their disobedience. Even so that, even so these also have been now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to his dis disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. Basically, the point is reiterating what Paul had said earlier. The rejection of the Messiah by the Jews has led to a blessing on the Gentiles for them to get the saving grace of Jesus. Yet, the saving grace of Jesus on the Gentiles is ultimately what will lead to God being able to have mercy on all, including the Jew, just like that picture in the book of Ruth. Ruth came to saving faith in God because of Israel, Naomi, but Naomi was redeemed because of the Gentile wedding when Boaz married Ruth. So it is a useful relationship for both. Verse 33, Oh, the depth of riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has the Lord or who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor, or who was first given to him, and it shall be repaid to him. So Paul is quoting the book of Job, and he's basically saying, oh, the depth of riches, both of wisdom and knowledge of God. What he's saying is, oh my goodness, who understands God? How unsearchable are his judgments? Who can possibly grasp all of God? Now, First 11 chapters of Romans are really Paul trying to explain how salvation works. And his conclusion of that is, man, it's really hard to understand. Because God is complex and awesome. And then quotes Job basically saying, who knows the mind of God? Who can counsel God? No one can tell God what he needs to do. Even though we try from an earthly standpoint all the time to tell God what he got wrong or what he should do for me in my life. How many of our prayers look like that? God, this is what I want you to do for me. I'm giving you some knowledge about what I think you should do. Because I think you need to know my perspective, God, to know what I need to happen for me. Um, that's kind of silly. That's the point, right? God is bigger. He has a bigger vision and a bigger picture and a better understanding. God is so much more than us. Who can be God's counselor? No one. Verse 36, for of him and through him and to him are all things. To whom be glory forever. Amen. So as we look through this chapter and we, we went through all of that, what is really the point? Has God turned his back on Israel? Nope. God still has a plan for them. And just because the majority have rejected the Messiah from the descendants of Jacob, there is still a remnant. And there is still a plan once the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. So there's still a plan for Israel. The church has not replaced Israel. However, the church was given a job. Go and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Why? So the fullness of the Gentiles can come in and the fullness of God's plan can come through. And we are active participants in it. So our job is to recognize that we need to get to work. We need to be participating in the plan to bring in the fullness of the Gentiles, to go and make disciples of all nations. So tonight, as we work together after the message to put together some food for people in need, it's good that we're being the hands and feet of Jesus in that way, that we're taking care of those in need. But let's also remember that we have something much more precious to offer than a packed lunch. We have the gospel, the saving message of Jesus Christ to offer the world who is drowning. Eternity hangs in the balance. And the death of Christ on the cross and the resurrection of Christ is the only thing that can save you and putting your faith in that is the only thing that gives you eternal life. And there's a whole lot of people in the world who need to hear it. And it's our job to be those messengers, active participants in bringing in the fullness of the Gentiles.
So let's do our job and pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for the conviction of Paul and the work of the Holy Spirit through him to give us this understanding. While it seems like this is one of the sections of Romans that doesn't get talked about from the pulpit enough, God, I pray that we walk away with a better understanding of the complex and totality of your biblical plan that you've given us. Help us to participate where we need to participate. Help us to magnify the ministry that you've given us, to find the thing that we can all do to participate in expanding the gospel and to take ownership of it so that those who need to hear it can hear it. Help us make a difference in this region and in the world for those who need to know the saving truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God, we humbly come before you knowing that we're small. But it doesn't matter how many people walk through our doors or how many people sit in our seats. Because the power comes where two or three are gathered or more. You are there. You're powerful enough. Your words are powerful enough. So God, we pray that you help us reach them those who need to hear it, with your words. As we went over last week, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We're going to preach that here. So help us reach ears with it. In Jesus' name, amen.